need is the way cosmos speaks it's the way goddess whispers goddess whispers in our ear through desire and need which creates rights and creates responsibilities and all of a sudden we just brought together superstructure and social structure in other words superstructure is the new story of value social structure is in part the field of law so we need to bring the new story of value superstructure and have it infuse social structure law in order to create new kinds of culture that can address technology that can address politics it's a hard day it's a beautiful day it's a it's a a tragic day it's a post tragic day where are we first we're we're all russians today right whatever we we think or or however we understand russia in all of its tragedy and all of its grandeur it's it's political and moral tragedy in so many ways on the world stage and it's it's grandeur in other ways but you know whenever people die in the world whenever people are are hurt or massacred you know we stand with the massacred you know in whatever country it is oh my god today is also purim anybody anybody know anything about purim so i'm not going to talk about purim today there's a lot to talk about but purim is a one of the major textual structures sacred text structures of the western world the lineage of solomon and i want to just just mention to say today's perm i just uh studied this morning with a a dear friend where we did a kind of deep dive kind of in a what we call holy of holies a deep dive on the inside into some sacred texts that weren't really around Purim, but were around kind of some of the broader themes. But I'll just give you just one sentence, and I'm going to talk about this in an entirely different one mountain. But at its very core, there's a text in the core text of the Megillah, which is the scroll of Esther, which tells the political story that takes place in Persia under the reign of Xerxes, several hundred years before the Common Era. It's a, a scroll in which the name of the divine does not appear. The only book in the sacred canon of the lineage of Solomon where the name of the divine right doesn't appear. And I remember sharing this with Barbara. It's, it's actually shocking and it's beautiful and it's beyond important. And there's this central theme in the scroll of Esther. And the theme is memory. The king can't sleep one night. And they take out Sefer HaZichronot. They take out the book of memory. And it's memory and it's loss that guides the story. Just like in the story that Joseph that Thomas Mann, excuse me, wrote about so extensively. The story of Joseph and his amazing Technicolor dream coat from approximately chapter 34, and then chapter 37, chapter 39 through 44 of the book of Genesis. The key issue is memory. Who remembers and who forgets? So today's Purim, and I want to just hold Purim with us just for a moment, just like we hold Ramadan or we hold Easter, or we hold, so we hold all of the holidays, the holy moments of the world religions, and each one has a, a particular contribution. And so here's the essence of Purim, just so we can, we can hold it and just have it in the space, and then we're going to step into the core of today. But first, we're just, we're finding our way in the day, we're finding our way in time. So the very essence of Purim, at, at its core, something like this 
in the Western understanding of reality. From Plato all the way through. The source of evil is the loss of knowledge. Everyone tracking that with me? The loss of knowledge creates evil. That's the essence of Plato, or at least one major dimension of Plato. Or to say it slightly differently, ignorance. Ignorance is the source of evil. For the lineage of Solomon, it's not the loss of knowledge, which is the source of evil. It's the loss of memory, which is the source of evil. So the need to recover memory on all levels, the entire trauma world is about recovering in an appropriate way the memories of the past. The entire essence of one mountain, many paths where we're gathered right, right now, today in this moment is an understanding that we can't respond to the meta crisis without a new story of value. And even knowing that there's a meta crisis to respond to, which means a meta crisis means that there may not be a future, we need to be related to the future. So we need to be able to access a memory of the future, right? That's not simple. It's quite hard to access a relationship with someone who's not in my geographical space, someone who's across the ocean. What do you do with someone who's across time, but not only across time in the past, where I can at least try and recover some traces, but across time in the future? So to be able to recover a memory of the future is the beginning of responding to the meta crisis. And what we're saying here in One Mountain, Many Paths is that the, the overwhelming moral imperative of this moment in time, the great revolutionary act, the great act of Eros, is to tell a new story of value that evokes the highest, most beautiful, most true, most good possible future that, that, that we already know is possible, but will not be the future. It's not where the future is going. It's not the natural vector of reality. The natur natural vector of reality as reality is now unfolding is to metacrisis, is to break down. And break down in a, in a quite serious way, right? Break down, which causes potentially the death of humanity or the death of our humanity, which are the two kinds, the two kinds of existential risk that we've laid out here. So memory, right? So this, this holy day, this sacred moment in the calendar of world religion is called Purim. And it's about knowing that it's not just the loss of knowledge. That's the potential source of evil. It's the loss of memory. Right? And being able to track the story. To know that the story might have multiple perspectives, but it doesn't have infinite perspectives. The story needs to be rooted right, in a, a fact-based storyline and a storyline of interior facts. Not everything is multiple perspectives. There are multiple perspectives within a context of, of a field of value, within a context of that which is better and that which is much worse. That's what a field of value means. There's an ought in the universe. And so we need to be able to tell the story, to recover the story from the past. That's what we need to do in a relationship. Can we together recover the story from the past? Know my place in the story in the present and, and recover the memory of the future. Because as we've said so many times, hope itself is a memory of the future. And so that's permanent. So, so welcome to Purim, right? Welcome to Purim, yay. David's about to read the code. We have a, a beyond huge week, right? A huge, wild, important, and, 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 you know, if she's good to us, a kind of groundbreaking week. We want to break new ground on multiple levels and actually enact and write a new story 
a new chapter in the great story of value in response to the meta crisis. And if you're new, so welcome. If you're new, if you've never been here before, right? We're here on one mountain and we're in this place in which we're poised between utopia and dystopia. And uh, Krista or whoever's doing that, we should always put in the chat box, the, the love or die little essay, which kind of explains the context of one mountain. We want to always have that every week so someone can open it up, take a look at it, copy and paste it. You know, if you're new, look at it afterwards. That's always great to have there. Okay. So we'll, we'll try that. will tr try and appear in the next minute or two if it's not there. Okay. Not, not to read now, but just to have, if you're new, copy and paste it, take a look at it later. It'll give you the deep context of one mountain again, which is about the great revolutionary act in this time between worlds and time between stories, much like Florence was in the Renaissance, in which da Vinci and Ficino tell a new story of value in response to that crisis, right? We're here to tell a new story of value in response to the meta crisis, which is exponentially more significant, meaning more dangerous, more deadly, right? Than the crisis of the Renaissance, because the crisis of the, Ren of the Renaissance has as much suffering as it could cause, which it did, it couldn't actually cause extinction. It couldn't cause the death of humanity and it couldn't cause the death of our humanity, right? We're now in a different moment. We're actually an extinction set of events is possible over time, even likely if you follow certain vectors of information and the response, the, the response to kind of control reality through systems of surveillance through a planetary stack, which creates a kind of embedded environment in which we gradually start living in quite literally a Skinner's box, which was the intention of B.F. Skinner when he wrote his book, Walden II, which portrays this idyllic world and which is the model that the leading designers of the web are following to kind of create a technologies of control with direct, direct access to the pulses of public culture in order to be able to shape desire, move them, direct them without anyone actually even knowing that it happened, a kind of benign totalitarianism that undermines free will and undermines the drama of decision-making without us even knowing that it happened. So those are the two forms of existential risk. And if you're new, we're here in one mountain as community, as communion, as delight, right? In the field of Eros, in the field of outrageous love, to tell this new story of value. And every week we engage in some dimension of telling that new story of value, sometimes in response to an event that just happened in the world, and other times in response to kind of a deepening in this story. Now, maybe just like one last sentence, everyone, one last sentence. You would expect, oh, why isn't this happening in Oxford? So I wrote my doctorate in Oxford, right, university, and nothing's happening in Oxford. And it's not happening in Harvard. And it's not happening in the the Sorbonne, right? It's not happening at the, the university centers, which are themselves kind of lost in the rivalrous conflict governed by win-lose metrics, just expressed in the bitter politics of the academy. But they're, they're not creating. They're not creating a new world. They're not looking at the meta crisis. They're not actually trying to go deep into the very source code of thought and evolve the source code. And so myself and Zach and many of us here, we've stepped out of kind of the mainstream institutions. And we've created a periphery institution with intention. And there's a book by Princeton University Press that I've mentioned a couple of times called Culture Moves, meaning how do you move culture? So you create a very strong periphery and then you deepen and deepen and deepen and deepen, not with surface content, not with content that's attention grabbing in a kind of you know web titling way, but you go deep in and and do the deepest possible work and create a, a community of depth and commitment. Particularly now we're saying around the articulation of a new story of value, we articulate that story, we write that story, we transcribe that story, we edit that story, we poeticize that story, right? We, we, we artistic that story, we publish that story, right? It's over, it's a 10 year process at least from now. We, we download it into the source code of culture and that's what Da Vinci did. That's what happened in the Renaissance, right? And when I say Da Vinci, I mean about the thousand core people who were involved at the center of the Renaissance. That's one mountain many passes. So that's what we're here to do. Okay, so that we're going to do a big, huge new week. We're gonna we're gonna pick up from last week, which was so gorgeously, stunningly recapitulated by Christina Amelon. 
David's going to read the code, which is the same code as last week. We're going to take it one step further, but then we're going to explode in, I hope, in an entirely new direction. I want to have this, with your permission, everyone, this super deep talk with you today, like to go like deep, deep inside, literally at the very, very, very leading edge of where culture is. Okay. So David, maybe read the code slowly and twice. Right, so we'll get it, and then we're going to dive in. Oh, my God. Here we go. Yes. So here's this week's evolutionary love code. There's no way to be filled with joy unless you are a hero. Heroes are real. Post-modernity problematized the hero. Post-modernity mocked the hero. Post-modernity said the hero is dangerous. Let's do away with the hero. Postmodernity was not entirely wrong. Heroes were dying for the wrong things, covering up their vulnerability, which was far greater than mere kryptonite. We needed to complexify the hero. But now that we've complexified the hero, we have to reclaim the hero. In cosmoerotic humanism, we call this the post-tragic hero. Homo amor is the post-tragic hero. One more time. There's no way to be filled with joy unless you are a hero. Heroes are real. Postmodernity problematized the hero. Postmodernity mocked the hero. Postmodernity said the hero is dangerous. Let's do away with the hero. Postmodernity was not entirely wrong. Heroes were dying for the wrong things. Heroes were covering up their vulnerability, which was far greater than mere kryptonite. We needed to complexify the hero. But now that we've complexified the hero, we have to reclaim the hero. In cosmoerotic humanism, we call this the post-tragic hero. Homo amor, which is the fulfillment of Homo sapiens, is the post-tragic hero. And with that, I turn my word to you, Dr. Mark. David, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, wonderful. So that's a big code. And I, just let me just check. And are we ready to go? We're going on a very deep dive today. So I want to just invite everyone to, to and myself, all of us, let's hold on to our seats. And we're going to take it step by step. Okay, we ready? We good? Who's good? Okay, here we go. Here we go. Welcome, 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 welcome. It's so crazy good to be together. It's so crazy good to be together. So here we go. And let's see if we can go like four or five steps. So we said in the code, post-modernity, problematizes the hero right so so what does that mean what does that mean what does it mean post-modernity problematizes the hero so the core move of post-modernity you know is 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 summed up by stephen hawking who you know is is wrongly cited for his views on spirit, Stephen Hawking was, was in many ways kind of a close to an idiot in terms of realms of spirit and philosophy. Of course, he suffered intensely, so he had direct existential access to to depth. I'm not talking about depth, he had depth. But he he kind of took as a given a kind of British disdain for interiors that reigned in, you know, the academy, a kind of disdain for any possibility beyond a kind of reductive scientific materialism. And there's a whole group of people that fit into that category. Dawkins today is an expression of that. There's a kind of caricaturing. Hawking's you know, would often caricature spirit in kind of primitive ways and then destroy his caricature. 
And so he says, for example, that one of the things that we're going to find out was probably true is that, you know, the human being was, you know, but a chemical stain, you know, an irrelevant chemical stain someplace that lived for a moment in the cosmos. It, it was that kind of, that's a reflection of not science, but of kind of a postmodern zeitgeist expressed by a scientist that's then lent authority because the scientist happens to be quite good at analyzing the structure of its in the universe, ITS its, I meaning he's a physicist, he's not good at life, very little to say about life, right? certainly very little to say about the self-reflective human mind, but he was very good at physics, which discusses it, but then claims based on that authority, right, to discuss actually life and, and interiors and the depth of the self-reflective human mind and, and meaning and values. So Hawking was just an example of something very problematic but and devastating and, 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 and wildly destructive, which was in vogue, right, and is still in vogue in, in much of the mainstream legacy establishments, right, people that I often say, like Yuval Harari, are still repeating that position one way or the other. So that's postmodernity. Postmodernity is the deconstruction of there being an ought in the universe, right? And when when Christine Amelon talked about the three questions of cosmorotic humanism, so the third question of cosmorotic humanism after where, where am I and where are we? Who, who am I and who are we is what, which is what ought be done. And ought is value. Ought means there's something that ought to be done. It's better for us to embrace than to be gratuitously violent. It's better for us to go deep than to remain superficial. It's better to be kind, right, than to be vicious. Right? There's an ought in the universe. That's the field of value. Okay? So a hero embodies the field of value. That's the nature of a hero. Does that make sense? A hero is a personal embodiment of the field of value. And so when a bunch of, as we said last week, a lineage of Solomon boys in Cleveland wanted to express the field of value, right? The way they did that was by enacting a superhero. The superhero doesn't explain where value's from, the superhero simply embodies value. That's modernity's relationship to value. I've called that the common sense, sacred axioms of value. The hero simply embodies value, which is why in response to post-modernity, which goes to deconstruct the field of value, in some sense, post-modernity's own response to its deconstruction, and when I say its own response, not its philosophical response, philosophy, philosophy basically accepted post-modernity's deconstruction of value, wrongly, and we, we've actually written this book that's actually about to go on Amazon on, I think, April 2nd, First Principles and First Values, which is about revisioning value in the field of value, and, and it's wildly exciting and wildly important. I want to ask everyone, when he goes on Amazon, we'll, we'll ask everyone to kind of, you know, you know, please, you know, buy it, share it, and we're going we're gonna to make this happen together. But bracket that for a second. So post-modernity deconstructs the field of value, there is no bio, there is no ought, and therefore there's no hero. Does everyone get that? Therefore, there's no hero because a hero embodies the field of value. And so when the postmodern world experiences postmodernity's deconstruction of the field of value, the response is in the 90s, early 2000, right? You know, into 2005 and 10 and 15 and 20, for 25 years, an explosion of hero movies. An explosion of hero movies, right? We go from Superman, right, to this entire resurrected pantheon of Marvel movies, which are resurrected DC and other comics, which spread around the world, which are about the hero. It's about the evolution of the hero. But what they all share in common is that the hero represents value. The hero incarnates value. And so as I've, I've shared before, when I want to spend time with my son and talk about value, what we'll do is we'll pick a series, which is some sort of hero movie, 
We watched, for example, all of Supergirl over about four years, right? We watched, I think, 126 episodes over four or five years. And in each one, what was actually at stake was always value, right? And when, when I'm talking about it, by the way, right, I'm talking about, you know, the Avengers, and I'm talking about the Pantheon of Heroes and Iron Man and, you know, and, and you know, the entire right, Black Widow, the entire pantheon, right, of Marvel DC comic heroes, right, which have created this huge universe, right, which has been the most successful box office move, meaning even as postmodernity deconstructs the field of value, there's this reclaiming of the hero by popular culture, rejecting, so popular culture intuitively and in reclaiming the hero is rejecting, does everyone get this? The philosophical fallacious claim of postmodernity that there's no field of value because the hero is all about value. The, the hero, it's very, very clear, right? In the Marvel universe, not because there's philosophers writing, it's this, this kind of primal knowing, this anthro-ontological intuition, anthro-human being ontology, knowing that's which is real, right? The mysteries that live within us, there's this knowing that the hero is actually incarnating something real. The hero is not an existentialist hero, right? In this great, you know, project of culture, which are Marvel movies and, and all the other shades thereof of the same kind of move. It's not an existential hero who is kind of a Sartrean hero, Sartre, who, who's read being in nothingness and says, there is no meaning and there is no value. Nonetheless, I'm going to, scream into the night and create value, even though it's, I know it's ultimately valueless, right? Even though there's cosmic meaninglessness, I'm going to try and rest, right? Meaning as an arbitrary social construct, but just because, because that's what I'm going to do, right? Out of the void. That That's not in any sense the tone, right? Of the entire project of culture of resurrecting hero movies. No, it's quite the opposite. It's that heroes actually incarnate the field of value, and more than that, heroes actually incarnate a very deep relationship, a very evolved relationship to the field of value. Heroes are not always right, they're vulnerable. They're imperfect vessels for the light. Heroes in the new sets of movies of the last 30 years are not Superman who comes out of Cleveland, Ohio in the 30s. They're, they're filled with holy and broken hallelujahs. We see Thor, right, for example, Thor, the, the thunder god of Asgard, who's the subject of quite a few movies in the Marvel universe, goes through many existential crises and, 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 and other, other such traumas. But, but they're heroes, and they're advanced in that they are early adopters of Homo Amor, what we've called the new human and the new humanity. And the core of Homo Amor is that Homo Amor experiences him or herself in the field of value with a relationship to the whole. The hero is omni-responsible. That's Bucky Fuller's term. The hero is omni-responsible and omni-considerate for the sake of the whole. So that's one. So the hero is the one who embodies the field of value and who stands for the field of value. And whether that's boys flooding the beaches of Normandy in World War II or whoever the vision of the hero is, men and women, because the hero is not a male category, it's a human category. And of course, the, the leagues of superheroes that have defined the cultural hero project of the last 30 years is filled with women, filled with women as heroes. And all of those heroes, even though they haven't formulated it well, understand that there's a larger field of value, there's a continuity of consciousness. So for example, the key scene in the kind of climax of 10 years of movies that went from like somewhere around 2008 or nine till about 2017, 18, 
and those movies climax in maybe what was either the most or next to the most kind of huge explosion into culture in terms of just its box office impact, which was called first, the first movie was Avengers, the, the Infinity Infinity Wars. And then the, the climax movie was the Avengers Endgame movie. The movie ends with Tony Stark giving up his life, right, to save, you know, the multiverse. And this realization that that he has to give up his life and and the realm of the personal, his, you know, his wife, you know, and his, you know, his child, and and step into this larger field in this moment, right, is core. And of course, there's this understanding that the story is not over, and that we can get beneath time, and that there's a a never ending story, and that there's various versions of reincarnations that's all a different conversation but there's this notion that i've got to give up the present day personal for the sake of the larger field or at least be willing to and once i'm willing to give up my present day personal life for the sake of the larger field then the invitation of the hero is not to give up my life but to actually live for the sake of the larger field not to die for the sake of the larger field but to democratize the hero and live and incarnate, right, in relationship to the larger field of value. Now, I want to go to the next step, okay? Ready for the next step? Who's ready? Who's ready? We ready? It's like a big, huge next step, okay? Big, huge, big, huge kind of crazy next step here, okay? So what I want to try and do, and we're going we're gonna to do a third week on the hero kind of next week, and we'll bring it back to, to many of the themes we've talked about and go this huge next step and start talking about the post-tragic hero. But for now, I want to focus, if I can, right, with your permission, friends, right, on value itself. So now I want to take this huge next step, huge next step. Now, I want to drop into value. Because we're talking about the field of value. We're talking about the hero incarnating the field of value, number two. And number three, what we've talked about, and this is all an explanation of the code, which says that postmodernity problematizes the hero, right? So the reason postmodernity problematizes the hero is because postmodernity deconstructs the field of value. Does that make sense? If there's no field of value, there's no hero, which is why, for example, the Barbie movie that we've talked about probably 10 times in the last six months, which is kind of the ultimate postmodern statement. It's not a cute movie, although somewhat cute, right? And it was a great moment of Ryan Gosling right, at the Oscars, you know, kind of doing I'm just Ken. But, but what the movie is actually saying is there's no field of value and therefore there's no hero. I'm just Ken. I'm just Ken. I'm not a hero. And Barbie opens with Ken saying to Barbie, look at me. And he goes and runs headlong, right? Heroically, right? Into a brick barrier. And Barbie looks at him and says, oh, wow, Ken, you're so amazing. But she's mocking him. And culture's mocking him, right? Ken is the, the wannabe hero who's not a hero. And Ken has to realize, I'm just Ken. There is no hero because there is no field of value. Does everyone get that? Okay, so that, that's where we're up to now. That's where you're up to now. N now we're going to take the big leap. So ready? We're now going to big leap. I'm going to do a little drum roll here. We need a drum roll for a big leap. Hold on here. Right? Who's, anyone going to drum roll with me? We got a drum roll. Are we ready? Okay, who is thinking like he shouldn't quit his day job and get a job as a drummer? I understand. Okay, so here we go. Big, crazy, wild move. And this is the next step, and it's a, a wildly important next step. So what is value? Okay, now I want to try and go. It's 149, right, Eastern time. So I'm going to try and go about 15 minutes now, okay? And it's like, but we need like every second, every step. So what is value? What is value itself? I'm talking about value. What is value? So value is clarified desire. When I clarify my desire, I disclose value, part one. But part two, 
That is because my desire is not local. There's no such thing as local desire. All individuated, clarified desire participates in the larger field of desire. Does everyone get that sentence? So if you have this desire burning in you and it's a clarified desire, it's not a superficial desire, right? It's not your trauma acting out. It's like, wow, this is my, what Barbara and I called my deepest heart's desire. And that's where this came from, right? That's where this, this came from when we talked about it five, six years ago. It came from this, that phrase that we deployed myself and Barbara so often came from this conversation we're about to have. My deepest heart's desire is what's called in the lineage, bearer. I've clarified my desire. So my clarified desire creates value, one. But two, because my clarified desire is not local, my clarified desire participates, right? With me, friends, right? Participates in the field of desire. So I access in my interior, the field of desire. I don't just live in the universe, the universe lives in me. I don't just live in a field of value, the field of value actually lives in me, right? So therefore I can access the field of value. Does that make sense? I can access the clarified field of value that actually lives in me. And the clarified field of value that lives in me expresses itself as my desire. I desire value. My deepest heart's desire is value. Now, value might mean life. Life is a value. Value might mean goodness. Value might mean eros. Right, We've talked about the eros of cosmos through an interior science equation where we understand eros to be all the way down the evolutionary chain and all the way up the evolutionary chain. We understand eros to be, eros equals the experience of radical aliveness, moving towards seeking, desiring ever deeper contact and ever greater wholeness. So that movement of reality of eros is towards deeper contact and greater wholeness which is the value of cosmos which is why we don't talk about eros we talk about eros value now let's track this so my desire is for eros for eros value my desire is for intimacy my desires for ever greater uniqueness, my desires for ever greater beauty, my desires for ever greater depth, my desires for ever more refined uniqueness, for ever deeper communion. These are all, as we unpack in this, this book, which is, I think I mentioned, is going to be on Amazon on April 2nd, Right. And it's crazy important. Right. We have to participate together and bring this into the world. But but we talk about all of these are first principles and first values, which we desire. So clarified desire. Discloses value. Now, let's stay close. We're looking at the edge of the edge. It doesn't happen in Oxford and Harvard. Right. Where it happens here. Okay, We're at the edge of the edge. So we want to let's pour into each other. Let's be kind of like we're in full devotion. We're in, we're in the, the best purity we can muster. And we're we're accessing Lionel Trilling's sincerity. Okay, so let's be sincere, pure and devoted as, as much as we can be together. And what a, a kind of <clears throat> unimaginable mad delight and privilege to, to be in this conversation with you. So let's go to the next step. So clarified desire is actually precisely the same as need. Does everyone get that? Clarified desire is actually precisely the same as need. So desire and need are actually identical. Now, let's stay close with this for a second. So at the foundational levels of evolution, the desire of a proton and neutron to come together 
380,000 years ABB after the Big Bang, right, to form a new hole, to have deeper contact and form a new hole of an atom, that is both a need, it's a primal need of the proton and the neutron, and it's a desire. And, and those terms I'm using not mythopoetically, right? Elena, this is our science conversation. I stake my life on that. This is not mythopoetic. That's the best description we can have of the interior face of cosmos in which we participate, in which participates in us. So that quality of need lives in me. That quality of desire lives in me. And there's an evolution of desire. There's an evolution of need. But need and desire animate reality all the way down and all the way up the evolutionary chain. And in fact, the name of God in the lineage of Solomon realization is <laughs> yud He vav He. Maybe someone will put it in the chat box. And yud He vav He, Yud is Ya, as in Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah, is the breath of reality, but it's the Yud entering the He, the Yin and the Yan, the upper waters and the lower waters, the Shiva and Shakti, the masculine and feminine, the line and circle that come together in Eros. And that's the first two letters of the divine name. And the second two letters are the Vav and the He. The Vav enters the He, right? And the Vav enters the He, the V enters the, the H, right? The Vav enters the He is also an expression of erotic union. So the four-letter name of God is the experience of desire. That's what desire. It's the experience of desire itself. Now stay close reaching for the future because and maybe someone can put it in english yh so people can just see it right right if you can kind of someone can kind of step up there who can actually step up and actually find it in english so we can get it to like a broader audience okay that's great thank you so yhvh so the y enters the h ya the v enters the h va yud hey vav hey four letters but the y the first letter y is a yud and yud is the future that's what the name means. So it's YHVH, would be, you know, kind of the English approximate, which is pure eros, the eros of cosmos, of, you know, allurement. The cosmorotic universe, protons, neutrons, electrons, the whole biosphere, and then into the human world. And yud -Hey is the, essentially the world of matter, allurement in the world of matter. And vav -Hey is allurement in the world of upper mammals and into the human world. And Yud, the first letter Yud, the Y is the future. So, so that means the name of God is the Eros value of reality. And it's pure Eros, pure erotic union. The Eros value of reality reaching for the future. That's what the name of God is, literally. And that name of God, that fuller name of God, I would say it was probably the most influential category forming the Western Renaissance. Right? And with enormous impact in the East as well, different conversation. So yud hey vav hey, this four-letter name of God is the kind of interior science monadic structure of reality, which is desire for future value. That's the name of God. And all of reality is names of God, meaning all of reality is in a field of value and all of reality desires future value. That's the, that's the core of the lineage of Solomon. But it also happens to be the core of Whitehead, right? <laughs> Who talks about reality having an appetite for value, for goodness, truth, and beauty, and beauty being the highest value of all, says Whitehead, right? And process and reality, which includes goodness and truth. And to be clear, by the way, I'm not a Whitehead reader. And it's I've taught and tried to unpack these ideas for many years the last 15 particularly, and then four or five times what Whiteheadians have come to me and said, take a look at this, take a look at that in Whitehead. So that's why I got to Whitehead. And then I, I corresponded with David Ray Griffin before he died. It was a beautiful, beautiful man. And 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 kind of shared with David cosmorotic humanism. And, you know, and David basically said, he's the leading Whitehead scholar in the world. He said, you know, Whitehead essentially came to the same conclusion you did through a different door, which made me happy. Okay. So the name of God is... Desire reaching for future value. So clarified desire reaches for the future, meaning it reaches for a value 
I mean, for something I don't have now, I want something, I have a desire. It's my deepest heart's desire. It's not available in the present, which is, of course, the weakness of the kind of Eckhart Tolle popularizations of kind of the present that undermine past and future. That'd be a huge mistake. It took us, you know, quite a few billion years and a few hundred, hundreds of millions of years and then tens of millions of years, right, to actually get to the place where we can actually hold past and future. Why would you obliterate that in an absurd regressive movement, which is only a present? You know, I have to have a clarified relationship to the future. I have to hold a memory of the future. I have to yearn and reach for the future. And that is my core desire. Now, at the foundational levels of evolution, desire and need are the same. So at the, the foundational levels of evolution, desire and need are the same. Then we go up the evolutionary chain. Okay, everyone with us? We go up the evolutionary chain, we go into the world of biology, then into the human world. And then in the human world, there's a certain point where there's this human experience of being a separate self, a false experience. I'm, a, I'm just a separate self. And I understand my needs are what I need to eat. I started experiencing my needs as kind of my primal need to simply survive. And my desires are something else. So there's this moment where we think that we that needs are kind of primal survival and desires are the, the kind of extra stuff, you know, creativity or, or whatever it might be. But that turns out not to be true. That's actually only an unclarified level of consciousness. When I actually clarify my consciousness, I realize that at the highest levels of evolution, just like at its foundational levels, need and desire are actually completely isomorphic. They're identical. Now, one of the examples people give to split between need and desire at the middle levels of evolution is they'll say something like, well, the human being will go on a hunger strike. And a hunger strike means I give up eating for the sake of a higher value, let's say freedom. So they'll say, oh, I'm giving up needs for desires. When that's actually not exactly true. No, I'm actually clarifying what my, what my actual needs are. And I'm clarifying that my needs are not only physical and my needs are not only survival. That I actually, my clarified need is I need freedom. I need freedom. Like, wow. Like there's a clarified need. And my clarified need and my clarified desire are isomorphic. They're identical. Now, Who's ready for a next step? Now, now, now we can make a next step. Okay, now we can make, and we want to we wanna literally break the ceiling. We want to break the philosophical ceiling in university departments around the world and in churches around the world. We literally want to break the ceiling now. So who's ready? Are we ready? We're ready, Gail? Let's pour energy into each other. Okay, let's be, be with each other like wide, wide if we can, if we can, permission, permission, wide, crazy, open heart, like all the way, okay? Well, let's, let's break the ceiling. Let's, let's now take like, this is where we wanted to get today. Now we're about to take the real the real step we wanted to take. We needed everything we said so far. So so at both the foundational levels of, of the evolutionary chain and at the highest levels, need and desire are actually isomorphic. And I need, my clarified need is always for value. So my need for food is for the value of life, right? And, and there might be other values, might be a value of eros or pleasure, right? But, but the core value underlies life. And I desire value. And my clarified need and my clarified desire are the same. So let's say I'm an artist. Let me just make this up, okay? I'm an artist. I'm some wild artist. I don't know. Let's give me a location. Let's say I'm painting the 12 faces of Eros, right? Or or let's say I I got this, you know, a completely different kind of artist. I got this, I'm just gonna make this up. I'm gonna, let's see, I don't know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a painting for every one of Shakespeare's sonnets. How about that? So is that a need or is that a desire? Well, depends, right? In other words, there, there's a level at which it's not a need the way food is, but actually, I might know myself so deeply that I need like breath, this level of 
of expression and depth. And without that level of depth, I actually die. Tom Hanks, the movie Castaway, right? About Tom Hanks who survives a, I think it's a cargo crash of some delivery service. I can't, not U-Haul. Um, what's it called? What's the other delivery service? Somebody help me, American Express. FedEx, thank you, FedEx, right? FedEx, thank you, thank you, right? And so Tom Hanks figures out on this beautiful island, a Caribbean-like paradise, he figures out how to master the neo-Darwinian thing. And he's got all of his survival needs met, but he decides that he needs conversation in which his interior meets the interior of another being. He tries using his blood to paint a face on a Wilson basketball, see if that works. Didn't, didn't take him home, but it worked for a while. And then he decides he's got no choice. He needs to create a, a raft. He doesn't really know how to create a raft and throw himself in the ocean you know, on the 1% chance that he's going to survive in order to fulfill this clarified desire, which is a clarified need, which is for one interior talking to another interior. Wow. Right? It's a big deal. So the value of intimate communion, which Tom Hanks feels on the castaway island, Right? It's not a desire, it's a fundamental need. It's a clarified need. Clarified need and clarified desire meet as one. And it's always a clarified desire and a clarified need for a value. Now, that clarified desire, which generates value, that clarified need generates value. And I'm going to use the, 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 the phrase of needs now. Absolute need creates absolute ethics. Everyone got that sense? Absolute need creates absolute ethics. So I need to breathe. So I absolute ethics, right? I have a full right to breathe. And now I want to make the, the leap. And this is so important in law. And this is actually, those of you who follow things like law journals, which I do to some extent, yes, that's a little bit of a crazy thing to do, but it's important, right? It, it, law is supposed to be the place where value instantiates. What's happened is laws become dissociated from value, which is why law can't address, for example, techno-feudalism. Law can't address Facebook or TikTok or Twitter, right? Law can't address the entire technological world because law is based on precedent. The precedent is usually from an older world in which value was taken to be real. And A, right, that value has been deconstructed. So precedent doesn't necessarily stand. And technology is moving so fast that there's often no precedent. And so law is dissociated from value, which is why it's almost impossible to formulate relevant laws. So for example, let's give you one example. So when we talk about attention hijacking that we've talked about here for the last four or five years, being at the core of techno-feudalism, the intentional deployment of machine intelligence to shape your desire and hijack your attention. And there's, at this point, such an enormous level of very, very good literature on the damage that, that causes, right? And the, the, the kind of depression, anxiety, destruction, polarization, the inability to place my sustained attention. And we can't even read, right? Let alone place our attention on issues that demand, right, an educated democracy, right, to, to formulate our future. And we certainly can't pay attention to the meta crisis, right? And, and we certainly can't pay attention to the future place our attention on the future. So this notion that, that attention is being hijacked. So we've talked about that many times. What's the weakness in that conversation? And why are all the books that criticize tech, what we call techno-feudalism, the techplex, why, why do they all fall flat? Why do they not move the techplex? Because th there's no formulated right to attention. You have to formulate a right to attention. There's no notion that I have a right to attention. So let's do that right now. I want to formulate with you a right to attention, a right to intimacy, a right to desire, right? I guess the word right doesn't help there. Okay, so let me take out my usual tendency to say right, which doesn't help in this flow. In other words, let me see if we can get it clearly. Ready? Do we have a drum roll now? Drum roll. Okay, big drum roll. So 
clarified desire equals clarified need, which generates clarified value. And clarified values are right. So Eros is the first principle and first value of reality. One of the faces of Eros is desire. Desire is a first principle and first value of reality. Reality is desire, or Whitehead said reality is appetite. Two, three, reality is desire for value. So desire for value is a first principle and first value of reality, which is the response to a fundamental need, because need and desire, clarified need and desire are the same. And what evolution is at its core, evolution is love in action and response to need. Or evolution is love and action in response to value. Or evolution is love and action in response to desire. Same thing. All three of those sentences are saying different facets of the same diamond, different facets of the same ontological evolutionary truth. So it's a big deal. So now we realize, okay, desire is a first principle and first value. We've just completed or just about completed a book in the last six weeks formulating attention as a first principle and first value, meaning attention is not a human creation, but the placing of attention is a first principle and first value of reality all the way down and all the way up the evolutionary chain. Intimacy is a first principle and first value of reality. So there's a right to intimacy and there's a right to attention. There's a right to desire. Now, stay close, my friends. <laughs> okay, let's stay close. We got to take Three more leaps. First, there's always rights and responsibilities. Rights never exist without responsibilities. You can't split rights and responsibilities. So if there's a right to ascension, there's a responsibility for attention. If there's a right to freedom, there's a responsibility and freedom. If there's a right to desire, there's a responsibility and desire, right? So there's always rights and responsibilities always operate together. <clears throat> now, Let's take a look at what a right to desire would actually look like. Let's go one more step, okay? We're at the edge of the edge of the edge of the edge of the edge here. We're literally creating new culture, okay? We're creating new structures. We'll write this up. We'll formulate it. This is going to make it into law review articles that Bainu is formulating now, right? But this is like we're at the edge of the edge of the edge. It's, it's insanely beautiful to actually see it. So let's say there's a right to desire, okay? So that means there's a right and responsibility, and it's bilateral. So for example, so first let's start with bilateral. Bilateral means I have a right to desire, and I have a right to be desired. Does that make sense, everyone? I have a right to desire and a right to be desired. Make sense? Bilateral. That's a shocking thing to say, right? And we're not talking just about, obviously, I'm going to say this is obvious, we're not talking only about sexual desire or sensual embodied desire. We're talking about, I have rights to be desired <clears throat> as a human being in all of my facets of my humanness. And I have a right to desire across all facets, right? To desire creativity and to desire depth and to desire beauty and to desire goodness and to desire truth and to desire embodied contact, right? Those are all, these are fundamental rights and responsibilities. So what that means is when I express my right to desire, I have to be responsible, right? I have to be responsible, meaning I have to express my right to desire in a, in a, in a, a context that has mutuality, that has depth, that has respect, that has ethos, right? That has appropriate boundary, that has appropriate sensitivity, right? That's all true. So I have a right to desire and I have a responsibility, right? To how I express my desire and I have a right to be desired and a responsibility in how I how I articulate right my being desirable in the world, how I action my being desirable in the world. Right? It's an interesting question. So for example, it's a it's taken as an absolute given. I'm just giving an example in terms of the sexual realm. It's taken as an absolute given in society that it is patriarchal nonsense to suggest, right, that a woman should walk with any level of modesty, right? Meaning, you know, let's say breasts should not be kind of almost fully exposed. If you say that, 
right? You're considered evil. Now let's go, let's go really slow with this, okay? <clears throat> of course, there's been horrific statements that have said, oh, she was dressed like that, she had it coming. That's disgusting, horrific, not true and evil. That's of course not the case, right? The way a woman or a man dresses doesn't give anyone a right to behave to them in any particular way. That's certainly not a way that violates their boundaries and their mutuality. That's a given. Having said that, if I know that a certain kind of dress generates a field of arousal, meaning it generates a response to me in which I am desired, right? I not only have a right to be desired, but I have a responsibility to how I express and articulate that experience of me being desirable. And I'm talking particularly now in the realm of the embodied sensual, but it would apply across fields and ranges of desire. How I express my desirability, right? And it's how I how I seduce, but not just seduce sexually, how I seduce emotionally and aesthetically and intellectually and artistically and you know, in terms economically and politically, all of that requires rights and responsibilities. It's a big deal. Okay. So there's always rights and responsibilities. They always live together. Now, I want to just stay with this for a second, just so we can kind of feel the full range of it. Okay, so one of the things our society, for example, has done, has said this kind of man and this kind of woman, they, and our visual propaganda has sought to kind of coerce this vision as desirable of man and woman. And these other visions, they're fine, but they're not desirable. Is that a responsible expression of the right to be desired? Probably not. We probably want to actually create a field of education, a field of value in which every human being experiences the utter and radical delight of desiring and being desired. And we actually have a social ethical responsibility not to, not to impose cultural aesthetics, right? But to allow for a free and open culture for sure, but also not to impose right, a cultural aesthetic which is homogenized, exclusive, and elitist, and only available to 1% of the population, and then the entire rest of the population lives yearning, oh, if I could look like that, man or woman, and be desired like that. Okay, so that's, that's a big deal. But now let's go back to our major track. That's the end, ending those two parentheses on desire. Those were two parentheses, subsets, and desire. Let's go back to our major track. If there's a right and a responsibility, then we have to need to action society in accordance with that right and responsibility. So for example, if there's a right to attention, then I don't have a right to steal your attention. It's a big deal. If there's a right to intimacy, then I don't have a right to violate your intimacy. Now you think this is like irrelevant. It's actually the hottest issue in law, right? How do we formulate a right to privacy? So there's an entire discussion now in the law reviews across the country, right, about what the right to privacy means or doesn't mean with an enormous amount of cases. And how do you formulate a right to privacy? So for example, if, you know, Google and University of Chicago, right, there's one case that's, you know, gone to the Supreme Court where the issue is, does Google have a right to buy from this University of Chicago hospital Right, 212,000 medical records with detailed medical notes. Right, does the, the hospital have a right to sell those records without the approval of the patient, or don't they? And so they're trying to figure out, well, why wouldn't they have a right to sell them? And so there's this appeal to the right to privacy. <laughs> but then in about seven or eight different legal articles that I've been looking at the last couple of weeks, there's this discussion, what's privacy? And ultimately privacy breaks down because virtually all of the eight journal articles that I looked at, right, are written by postmodern legal theorists who basically, right, basically say there is no intrinsic right to privacy. It's gotta be grounded in a larger right. And so now one of my closest friends, students, colleagues, right, Venu, right, is actually just completed a law review article called The Right to Intimacy, in which he spends kind of the middle of the article articulating this notion of first principles and first values. He cites this book, First Principles and First Values, right, extensively, 
right, to actually formulate a right to intimacy grounded in a field of value. And, and of course, that formulation and that article needs to be, you know, we're, we're now working on the last pieces of it and we want to land it, right? But also a right to attention, right? And a right to desire, right? Rights are core. Whenever there's a core need, there's a core right. And need is the way cosmos speaks. It's the way goddess whispers. Goddess whispers in our ear through desire and need, which creates rights and creates responsibilities. And all of a sudden, what we just did is, and I'm going to finish here, we just brought together what we've called in earlier conversations, superstructure and social structure. Does everyone get that? In other words, superstructure is the new story of value. Social structure is in part the field of law. So we need to bring the new story of value, superstructure, and have it infuse social structure law in order to create new kinds of culture that can address technology, that can address politics. That's what we're trying to do. Oh, okay. I think we can hold here for a second. That was a lot, right? Let me just do a check-in for a second, right? How, how many people kind of stayed with us and got through that? That was a lot. That was a big huge leap okay it was a huge it's a huge breakthrough right in understanding the relationship of and and, and maybe like the last sentence let me just I, mean, I can just give you the flow so the flow is a desire two b let's do it this way one desire two clarified desire three equals need four clarified need so clarified desire plus clarified need, which are ultimately two faces of the one, generate value. And because the need is clarified and the desire is clarified, the, des the value is clarified, right? Generate equals clarified value. Clarified value generates rights and responsibilities, which means, does everyone get this? That first principles and first values are the ground Right? That new superstructure of first principles and first values, they are the ground of a new social structure, right? meaning a new system of law. Right? And, and you know, I've been talking about this in different ways, friends, for about seven, eight years. Vena was with us, if you all remember, at the Mystery School in Europe where we talked about the right to intimacy. Right? And he, he's codifying it in these, these, these law review articles. And Vayner's done a very, very deep dive into, right, into, you know, dozens and dozens of legal articles, right, in order to, you know, law review articles, in order to kind of formulate this clearly. And we're going to, you know, we're going to put out this, this law review article fairly, fairly soon. But this is just one example of the kind of move we have to make in which superstructure, right, the new story of value has to begin to reshape our story. And so again, just to notice, I just want everyone just to notice the, and I know everyone's like, oh, this is not realistic. It's not going to happen. No, no, no. The only thing that's realistic is that it will happen, right? Change is the only realism, right? The notion that it doesn't change is unrealistic. It always changes. And we need to create the vessels, the structures, right? Right. The horses, right? That can actually carry the change. And so this move of superstructure downloading into social structure, right, of an evolution of the source code, which can now tell the new story of value, which can now reshape the story of culture is critical. And of course, the example of attention is the most dramatic example, right? There's 10 books that have been written in the last five, six, seven, eight years, decrying stolen attention, but no grounded objection. What's wrong with that? And unless you can ground your objection to hijacked attention in the field of value, and you can actually show that this is a violation of value because we have a right to attention because attention is a first principle and first value. The, common, the conversation is a non-starter and it's actually begin to be grounded in law. So, wow. Oh my God. Okay. Wow.